Click your button. There you go. Uh, I've just been informed uh, we all take tea and coffee for granted when we go and have our tea and coffee out there. I just want to point out that Dave has been doing that for 40 years. Oh, yeah. 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 Badge. <laughs> 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 yeah, so you've got to try and get him working while you're yeah, doing uh, it. Any new members, Chris? Yes, yes right. We've had uh, three applications for membership this, uh, in the interval, so if these people could stand for one brief moment, we'd be very happy. We have Peter Martin. Great, Peter. Thank you. Yes, thank you Ryan Jones. Thank you. Welcome, Brian. From Vicus Mysore. Chris, welcome. Might take a while to switch it back on to the board. Yeah, I'll just have a live in the meantime. <laughs> so, I, are all the members happy and accept our new members? Yeah. Well, so a show of hands, thank you very much. I think that's a, a problem for the majority there. Just didn't get any. <laughs> and the scariest part, any objections? <laughs> 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 In that case, uh, welcome to the society and uh, hopefully your memory shall be a long one. We've, we've got members of here from 40 odd years, i.e. Dave, Rob, myself and one or two others. Um, <laughs> it does become addictive, believe me. Oh, it's come on. It just takes too long. So we're just waiting for technology to catch up with us on this. Yeah. Um, Part of the Drake equation, as Gary's been going through, it comes to technology, a society that's Later technologically on. advanced enough to have a five in the building surprised. that doesn't let them down. I'm shocked. Yeah. Well, that is part of the discussion, by all means, yeah, ask the question. We come under the head of intelligence. <laughs> oh, do we? My yeah. God, I feel sorry for that. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, so we did Tau Seta, let's see if that works. Good. Ignore the numbers to some extent. They're good for ratio comparison, but the numbers are uh, considerably out of date. What that tells us is that when we started to look for planets, we tended to find these big fellas easy, for obvious reasons. So many obvious reasons. Uh, so Jovian sized and even bigger, Neptunian. Super Terran doesn't always mean like a super air. It often means a bit like a, an ice earth and all kinds of stuff. So you have to watch out. It's not necessarily a rocky planet, depending on what you're choosing to read that day. Currently, there are somewhere towards 6,000 exoplanets, official exoplanets. There's several thousand others still being investigated with all the data we're trying to go through. And obviously, We've got to classify these planets. We've got to say, okay, what kind of planet do we think we're looking at? And um, for reasons that are often fairly obvious. So they're the general classifications, but these are the more important ones. When we look at planets, how far away they from their star, that's kind of this orbital period at the bottom, and what's their relative size compared to the Earth? That's a, a fairly important consideration. When you've got a planet which is five times bigger than Jupiter, it's not a planet anymore, it's a star. So there is a limit to the size of a planet, full stop. But when planets are really close to their stars, here, oh, these are pretty obvious. If you've got a rocky world close to its planet, it just likes a big ball of lava. It's just going to be a free floating bubble of lava going around the star. Okay? Slowly effervescing its rock away. And then as we come out further, the rock, the lava will solidify, and we've basically started to look at Earth planets uh, around here. Now, look at this. This is orbital of 10 days to about 100 days. Now, the Earth would fall in somewhere in this region. So it does fall in that region, quite an extreme part of that region. Okay, but this is based on all stars, not just the sun. So when you're near a, an M-type star, if you were, rocky planets kind of start there, just a couple of days away in, in orbit from its star. It's not a ball of molten lava, it's, it's solid, it's rock, it's got a crust, probably an iron core. 
bit less useful, but interesting because I imagine you could get some evolution going on in ocean worlds. It's pretty obvious. Look at the Earth. It's not inconceivable you can get a lot of evolution going on in ocean worlds. Ice giants, a little bit harder, but you imagine these planets doing a dance around their star. And for 10 million years or a billion years, it's a bit closer to its star and the ice has melted and there's a bit of water there and life begins. The slow process of freezing that water, life will find a way of surviving in the ice. <clears throat> Whether it could survive for a billion years in a bowl, that might be a stretch of the imagination. Okay? Cold gas giants, we're kind of looking at Jupiters and Saturns to some degree for there. And then hot Jupiters, well, we don't have an example of that, but there are some great planets out there with some great artistic renditions of them, which are like Jupiters, which are just boiling on one side and frozen on the other because they're often tidally locked. And the dynamics going on in those particular planets must be an absolute sight if you could actually film it. It'd be better than anything you could see in Hollywood. Okay, so we classify our planets with those basic labels. A nice part of this is kind of how do we discover uh, these planets in general? I mean, some of them get discovered by certain methods, full stop. They can get discovered by other methods as well. And we're going to look at a couple of these methods, which are the most prominent ones, uh, in a few minutes. Current potential habitable planets. <coughs> so out of all of that big diagram, only some of them can be what we call habitable by something like us. If you want to call that a limitation, it is. Because I think there's a lot more out there. But there's ten of them here. And... Uh, you know, my favourite Tau Ceti. Um, Kepler, Gliese, Kepler, Tau Ceti, a couple more Keplers, and HD and Gliese again. These are planets which we've discovered around their stars, and we think they're in the right place, and they're possibly the right kind of planet. And I'll tell you something, the amount of work that I hope goes on for these particular planets over the next few years, because of the new techniques we're developing, we could easily find one of them or another very like them in the, in, later on in the list. That's just the top ten, as opposed to they're the only ten. That's just the top ten. We're going to look at these in different methods, and one of them will be microlensing, which is a method where the star shines light through the planet when it's in line with us, through its atmosphere. And when it goes through the atmosphere, it grabs hold of the spectral information of that atmosphere. And we just look at the spectrum. We know what the spectrum of the star should look like, and we subtract that from the diagram, and we're left with the spectrum of this atmosphere. And I tell you something, we can tell quite a lot. I mean, we've dangerously done it with Venus a few years ago. Well, it wasn't quite Venus. We did it differently. We found that stupid gas, forgot what the name is, but um, we still haven't worked out how it got there. I'm still waiting for the answer to that question in particular. Mm -hmm. But there's 10 of them. And most people aren't aware that we have a load of planets out there we think could be just like Earth already. And I think that's phenomenal in the short time we've been studying these. Okay, But that's how many planets. We found 5,000 and there's the top 10. Let's have a look at those methods. That found over 3,000 of them. End of story. I'll go into more detail in a minute on that. As a planet, anyone who's around, I think it was 2002, 2000, 2004, Mercury and Venus were crossing the sun. I think 2008 as well. That was the last time it was in for 150 years. Um, when a planet passes in front of its star and we're looking at it, it just obscures a very small percentage of the light. And believe it or not, we have the technology to say something got in the way. <laughs> It's as simple as that. And we say, very good chance that's a planet. And if we keep on observing the star, it'll repeat itself. Now, we're lucky with these silly little M-type stars. Because these things happen every few days. Okay? And if you look at it for a few days, you'll see it. With, with, this, with the planets we're really trying to look for, you've got to imagine a hundred 
to 400 days. So you've got to keep an eye on that star for that long for really, really good candidates of Earths. Because we've already discounted these M stars ones that only go around in sort of one, two, three, four, five, six days. So that has found over 3,000 on its own. Possibly more than that, to be honest. This was the first ever planet discovered. It, well, an example of how it was discovered. It's called the radial method, uh, Doppler shift. Any of us have heard of it. The diagram here changes colour on purpose. So you imagine here we are looking that way. Now, when that star is going towards us, it looks blue. When it's going away from us, it looks red. When it's going towards <coughs> us, it looks blue. What you've got to realise, every planet makes a star wobble. Even the Earth makes the sun wobble. Not a lot, because it's not that big. But Jupiter makes the sun wobble a lot. Believe it or not, the wobble for the sun is pretty much just outside of the sun for Jupiter. And only a few years ago, we had a whole series of planets in line, and they were all tugging on the sun in the same direction. So they're all working together, and they'll produce that bigger tug. And that was related to that earlier picture of Barnard Star, which we were trying to measure that tug, that dance of the star through the sky. So this method in 1992 found the first ever three exoplanets. Problem is they were found around a pulsar. <laughs> so Draga, uh, Fobator and Poltergeist were the name of the three planets. Sadly, are not very good candidates for life. But what they proved to me, as I've said earlier, is when stars explode, the planets don't go with them. They're still there. So this pulsar, it was a, a massive explosion, and the three planets, and one of them is only the size of the moon. So that's how accurate this was. But the reason why we know that for this particular thing, I'm sure many of you are aware, pulsars are like the atomic clocks of space. And if you play with an atomic clock and Doppler shift, the accuracy to which you can measure things is immense. And that's how you can find a two and a half thousand light year away pulsar with a moon sized planet going around it. Two and a half thousand light years away. It's probably still the record holder for that unless there's another pulsar that's been discovered. Wow, what a distance to find planets, your first planets, two and a half thousand light years away. Must be. 100,000 stars in that kind of range. So, that was the first method, and there were three planets, two of them, I believe, are sort of maybe Earth-sized, and the other one is definitely Moon-sized. So, that was the first method using Doppler shift of time, <laughs> not Doppler shift so much of colour. It's the change in the timing signal of the pulsar. It can be measured by our atomic clock, so we can measure the difference, and it's, a, it's an easy bit of maths, believe it or not. Not that any of you would want to do it. Um, and that was the first method. So we're going to go back to this other method here because the unsung hero. Hubble is not my favourite spacecraft on it. I found it quite funny when they had to give it a pair of glasses. JWST, fabulous what it does, but you can't make it do this. What a waste of JWST that would be. It's got to sit and look at a star for a day, a week, a month. Oh, God, what a, waste of, what a waste of a fantastic piece of kit to do that. So JWST is not designed to do this, but it'll do it as it's doing its other things. So it, its data is multiple use. Kepler was only in space for a bit under 10 years. Uh, I forget what year it completed now, 2017 comes to mind, but I'm probably wrong. Uh, yeah. As of October 2018, so probably right. <laughs> the thing I find quite funny is I could pick the entire amount of its data on my computer. <laughs> okay, so. But this is a space probe that was 94 million miles away, so it wasn't in orbit around the air. Okay, I'm not even sure that's a, a Lagrange point. It wasn't, I know it wasn't in a Lagrange point based on that. Um, so, it found 61 supernovae. Two and a half thousand planets, that's got to be since that figure. Um, its job was to only look at half a million stars. 
it wasn't looking at the whole space. Because the probe was just designed to pretty much keep on spinning around slowly and look at a slice of space. And in that slice, it was pretty much looking at uh, half a million stars. Because it's not a massive telescope, but you know, we used unimportant. But this found most of the planets. It's the most, one of the most successful probes we've ever launched from here. And a lot of people are not quite aware of that. So Kepler, unsung hero. Let's get back to our favourite fellow, Mr. Drake. Fraction of suitable planets on which life actually appears. I've taught a lot of biology over the years. I've always found this little animal quite interesting. Um, ignore the Hollywood picture, I put that in just for display. That's what it really looks like. Um, so, this multiple celled animal only lives for a couple of months. Well, it can live for 30 years in a dormant state. So if you go to sleep for 30 years, you can wake it up and it'll live for three months and then die. Wow, what an animal. It can go down to minus 196. I'm not sure if that's liquid nitrogen. Probably got far off it. 151 degree. See, now it will, can't survive in there permanently, of course. That's the, the extremes. The idea of that is it, you can put it down to there for a short period and it'll live. You can put it up to that kind of temperature for a short period and it'll still live. And the worst is you can stick it out in the middle of space and bombard it with cosmic radiation and bring it back to Earth and give it a bit of water and it'll go, hello. <laughs> it just, it doesn't get bothered by much. And this is a boring little animal on here. Great name, Tardy Grade, I love them. Um, yeah, it doesn't actually have the name on there, does it? Tardy grades, they're called. <laughs> okay, I need to put that on actually. And it's a basic designed animal. And it does everything most animals do. Wow, fancy sticking that on a nice sheet. Fancy sticking that in some boiling water. It's amazing what an animal can live in if you give it half the opportunity. Because that's not even the, the most severe animal. We've got animals on Earth that live in every environment that you can name. Okay, acid lakes next to nuclear power plants, next to nuclear radiation. And then we've got ice sheets. We've got the polar regions, for as long as they last. We've got the polar regions. Animals live on them. Some animals actually live in those things. Because the Antarctic, believe it or not, is an ice sheet on top of land, if you've forgotten. Whereas the North Pole is just floating ice. So, the, and there's a lake underneath Antarctica, the ice sheet as well. So in the middle of that land is one of the biggest lakes on Earth. So the Earth is quite diverse. I mean, the life that lives in it is, wow, multiple diverse stuff. So anything can live in anything. So the lakes, which I find quite amazing because most animals really, really don't like alkalis. We're, we're mostly acidic creatures uh, on Earth. But we've got animals that make their point of living in the most weird place that we do not want to go near or anything else that's alive wants to go near so to imagine that life couldn't exist in the most extreme of circumstances on ice moons watery planets hot water planets well i don't think anything's going to live on a lava world but that's a different one. that's a different idea <clears throat> Yeah, well, there's the big question we got asked before. I do ask it, are we, are we intelligent? Well, my answer to that is no, but that's beside the point. Um, intelligence, fraction of life-bearing planets which intelligent life emerges. We've had six mass extinctions on Earth alone in, say, two billion years. And we know they've exi we know they've happened. The geological record just doesn't lie. Last one was obvious 66 million years ago. Big Yucatan comet. Bingo. Dinosaurs dead. Little creatures like us. Well, slightly little than us, but little creatures like us grew up to be us. Okay, the mammals took over. The lizards got killed. It's that change in circumstances that drives evolution. 
if you give it, and it took 66 million years to get to where we are, because we've only been on Earth for 6 million years, if you really won't stretch it that far. Okay, so the idea is that 60 million years it took to get from something the size of a dog or a cat to us. So it does take time. You've got to give life a big start and then a load of time for it to generate that intelligent life. So it's not easy. And I love these two animals because, well, these, yeah, I, I'm a water baby, so stick me in the sea and just ask me to swim all day. I need some fish. Oh, how life that is. And they're intelligent. Okay, because their social structure is probably as good as humans. These, their social structure is as good as humans. Not quite as nice to each other. But they're fairly intelligent. And you've got the crow that can take a nut and smack it on a rock. Magpies do the same. Lots of animals learn tricks because of evolution. So intelligence is about what do you call intelligent? I don't think we're that intelligent yet. As the next few slides start to maybe head down that kind of road. Fraction of civilizations that develop a technology that releases detectable signals of their existence into space. Okay, when I should have been working today, luckily I'd finished all my exam prep for the kids, um, I actually sat on a SETI website that allowed me to tap in dish sizes, signal strength, and how far you could detect a signal. And I was surprised by some of the figures, to be honest. But we could send a powerful TV signal out, which only works at uh, a few megahertz, if I've got it in my head right, rather than gigahertz. And that doesn't go out very far. As a matter of fact, we would need a dish like bigger than our SIBO sending a TV signal to a star directly for that star to use a dish like Arecibo to detect that signal. That's just the nearest couple of stars. We don't, that, that signal's not good. What I've worked out is that gigahertz works well, so your, your lovely 3G signal, 4G signal, 5G signal, they're great. They go further into space. And with a fairly small kit, sending out a signal of that frequency into space, it will go tens of parsecs, a parsec is below the three light years, and that's just with normal kit. So we're, we're probably within that technology and we do already send out signals. SETI has done that. Uh, probably as early as the 60s, they used Arecibo to send out the occasional signal to some of the planets, uh, to some of the stars, in that particular zone for our Arecibo, which was a very limited dish, but it was heavily used for SETI. The wow signal. Uh, let's see what it tells me. 1977, August the 15th. Some guy sat looking at his printout from that telescope, and it started coming up with all these weird letters and a couple of high numbers, but the weird letters were the killers because that is just like, wow, it's blowing the socks off my signal. And as you can see here, most of, it, most of it's blank or ones and twos and the occasional three. So this is like 6 E Q U J UJ5. He looked at that and he went, oh, you, that, wow. And he wrote it down. So that was called a wow signal for that reason, because I remember that one. Again, Patrick Moore. Pity I never met the guy. So, wow signal. Great idea, he thought he detected the signal that was from a civilization. And for a long time, no one discredited him. In 2017, <laughs> he was discredited. What it was, was he was looking when he did this at Sagittarius. And some bright spark knew the date, August the 15th, 1977, and found there were two comets right in his field of view. And what they did in 2017 is these, one of these comets came back and they took another little thing like that, more modern version I expect, but they did the exact same thing again and they came up with more or less the same signal. So sad. He was discovering comets before his time. He wanted to discover aliens. So that's the wow signal. We've been delivering signals out in space for 100 years. 
those boring radio TV signals, oh, I'm sorry, they're just not getting outside our solar system. Don't worry about them, aliens are not going to come and beat us up because they've detected those. Uh, the Arecibo signal, that's a different deal. That did go out to a limited number of stars. And then more importantly, I don't know the nearest one of them might be 10, 12, 15 years away. So they might have received that now. They might have only just sent a signal back if we were lucky. Okay? So the idea that we can communicate with them is a little bit far-fetched, even if you're in watching content. <laughs> Let's do some war physics. Okay, so we've been delivering signals out into space which somebody with the right tech probably could listen to. Okay? They'd have to have a solar system-sized detector to detect our boring TV signals. Yeah, this is a very interesting one, especially at the moment. Does anyone survive? Length of time should civilizations release detectable signals into space? Okay. I look at what we've been doing for the last hundred years. We've been sending out TV signals. We don't send them out anymore. We've moved off analog. We're now on digital. So that little span of signals was a hundred years wide, which in cosmic terms is about a billionth of a second trillion to the second it's nothing it's like no one was ever listening during that small spell of time probably does anyone detect the signals well let's assume there's life out there i think the answer to that is quite simply yes i think they can and if they're listening they probably will because that's just the nature of space if we send a signal out and they have a big enough dish to listen to that signal, they can see it's not noise anymore, and they can go, that's an unusual signal, a bit like a wow signal, and they investigate that. <laughs> Hopefully it doesn't take them 40 years to work out it's a comet. Okay, so the idea is we, 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 we can detect them, they can detect us. That's probably not a problem. But how long do we send signals out for? Because I imagine in our lifetime, we work on the internet, that's a wide system. We stop pretty much sending out a lot of signals. We beam our signals at the air for Musk's SpaceX stuff. What are they called? There's probes going on. A system, right? We beam most of them signals, yeah, at the air, so most of that doesn't get reflected out, so that's very weak indeed. So that's important. But the question is, is there anybody out there? Okay. I think it was 1972, but it was somewhere in the 70s. Frank Drake, Carl Sagan, Otto Struve, the guy who won the Nobel Prize for photosynthesis, don't know his name, was actually given the prize in that meeting. Twelve guys sat down. Astronomers, biologists, chemists. And they came up with a figure based on what information they thought they had and their really extensive knowledge. We're talking about some of the brightest guys on Earth at the time looking at that. And they said just for our Milky Way, they said 10,000 civilizations. Yeah, that was their number. I think they've overestimated it by at least one order of magnitude. I wouldn't object to a thousand. But well, hundred is probably more likely. Even if you go to a hundred, that's interesting. Because now you look at it, this galaxy's been here for 13.2 billion years. If you spread that 10,000 civilizations across that time, most of these civilizations barely overlap. Especially when you talk about a hundred years. So if you imagine the first three billion, four billion years of our galaxy life started to emerge in some little planets over here and there and those continued to develop and then our sun got made five billion years after that well five billion years after that so five billion years later our sun comes along and 4.7 billion years later we're here so what i call the overlap idea a lot of these civilizations don't overlap and then if you look at the vast distances of space, the only way overlapping matters is if you're next door. 
ish within a hundred light years maybe say because anything beyond that the technology changes and you stop detecting their signals because they stop sending them out they stop detecting your signals because you stop sending them out and there's no overlap period of detection unless you get visited by little green men believe it or not i don't believe in most oh no, no, I'll even i don't believe in any of them i don't believe we get visited by aliens but that's purely on a technological point and I'm te technologically limited, believe it or not. So I look at most green men, UFO kind of conspiracists as slightly kooky people who've had a bad day on some drugs or something. That's my personal view. My view. I hope I am wrong actually, to be honest. I'd love them to prove me wrong because it kind of comes down to this. The Fermi paradox refers to the dichotomy between the high probability that extraterrestrials exist, 10,000 of them in our Milky Way, and the fact that we have no evidence. If we ignore people who think they've seen aliens, because wow, with all the tech we've got these days, the pictures are always blurred. It's obviously come out of Hollywood or something with, you know, it's just, oh, come on, please, for God. Give us a chance, give us a nice clear picture of a grey alien. Yeah, I'll start believing in little four like gods then. Stargate one for those who know what I'm talking about. Um, so this kind of tells me, or it's telling me there's no life out there. I don't believe it. <laughs> okay, my, my personal view. But it is a very important statement to be considered. We've got no real evidence that there's anything out there. We've got lots of little bits of circumstantial stuff. So basically, Drake came up with seven measurements that if you had the figures for them, you come up with a number. His number and his friend's number was 10,000. I did this calculation before I knew it was 10,000, and my personal number was around 100. Okay, so I was obviously more pessimistic than them, which is not something I normally accuse myself of. So the idea that I came up with 100 is pretty decent, but it's only two orders of magnitude difference. So there we go, Drake's equation. And quite simply, if you multiply all them numbers together, you get the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Questions are welcome. Questions are welcome. Got the same wow signal, yeah. yeah, yeah. It works for me. Excellent, guys. One of my favourite films, and you did switch on a contact, Jodie Foster. Yeah. And they do talk about the equation, and uh, they also talk about the wow signal. And it's quite an exciting moment when that signal comes through through the big basic speakers. And it's that moment of thought, what if we did on a contact? Well, it's like a ping, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. It's like it's your microwave yeah. going bing. And there you go, it's so obvious that that noise is there compared to the boring silence of the background. And that's what that poor guy sat there when he looked at them numbers. I could understand why he thought what he thought. But the, the sad thing about it is uh, you touched on the analog uh, signals basically switched off yeah. in 2000 or thereabouts. Um, that includes the radio and the TV. Yeah. The only analog transmitters <coughs> these days, FM, I think that is megahertz is in Poland and the old Soviet nations and countries. And they'll go and still transmitting. So their television programs are still going out there to the edge of the solar system. But sadly for anybody on the edge of the solar system, they're just watching the last ever episode of Doctor Who. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't know that they can't survive the transition or not. Could be where they could be watching the movements. Well the saddest part is they'll never know so what they never know what happened to in the show. There we go. Um, the fascinating thing about what we're looking at here with all those stars out there is when you look through a telescope, I, I got to the point in my amateur astronomy seeing these dots, some of red, some of blue, and occasional red, very well developed the green one. But they're just stars, they just look like little dots, and we're going, that's 500 light years away, and there's a bit of time travel there as well. But now, in the latter 20 years of my amateur astronomy, I look at them and I think that there are planets around them. How we think of them has changed it's in our lifetime considerably. And that leads me to what, if you had to write that formula again, how would you do it? 
The, that's, the whole point is that formula does ask everything that needs to be asked about, is there life out there? Because it's a set of progressions looking at, okay, let's count how many stars we've got. Let's see if, how many of them have planets around them. How many of them have them in the Goldilocks zone? How many of those planets could be life? Rocky planets, for example, water worlds. And then you go, how many of them actually do create life? That's the, that's the pick a number out the sky number. Um, I'll put the, the questions to the audience, which is the main is habitable moon topic, because I think when you thought of the equation originally, you didn't realise that moon was going to have a Well, we look so at Titan. There's perhaps like also the fact that you've a greater number of moons that are habitable on the planet. You could be closer to the truth, because when you look at the sort of many moons of Jupiter, so many of them could be water underneath the ice. Mm -hmm. And there you go. And that's the beginnings. And, once you get life, you, I think life always proliferates once it starts. Yeah, if it's as the sun expands, they become more habitable. They become habitable, we don't. Naturally. No, actually, they're, more, they're habitable now because of their orbits around Jupiter, squeezing them all the time. They actually have hot cores. Yeah. The water is warm, effectively. But the problem is they are getting radiated by Jupiter, so... <laughs> yeah. Can't put them all. As the sun expands, what happens to Jupiter in its atmosphere? That, that, that won't be affected. That won't be affected. It's far too powerful a planet. It'd have, to, it'd have to be in a three-day orbit around the sun, a bit like them M stars, for it to be affected. The sun will change again. One thought on thing as well is, I don't know whether you're, what you're looking at is today, but most of the universe is caused to be disconnected from us, in which we can't do science on because it's expanding away from us faster than light. Correct. So, given that these numbers will depend on like all of the universe, as you, as you mentioned, well, no, actually, this is only on about our Milky Way. I extended the idea to say, well, we've got two trillion galaxies. Yeah. You can extend the idea quite easily. They could exist, but we never know because you can't get Correct. them. They'll they never be detectable. Yeah. Right now, for those who don't know, at the edge of the universe, effectively, there are objects flying out of our universe and they become invisible. We're not seeing them anymore. What percentage of the Milky Way can you observe? Uh, well, the, the probe that did the best job on that, I'm just trying to say now, the one that mapped all about a billion stars, every single motion of them, okay. Gaia. Gaia basically gave us a picture of all of those stars travelling around our galaxy, but it probably only looked at, at the best of one third of the galaxy, and a little bit towards the Magellanic Cloud, because it picked a few of them huge south as well. <laughs> yeah, so when, when we look at our our galaxy, the best place to look is not through the edge, it's just up and down, because you get a clear view. The bottom line is if you look up through our galaxy, you're just looking through cloud. So it's better to look out that way. So when Hubble took its deep space photo, it looked out. Because it doesn't want to look through all that, because Hubble would never look through the galaxy. It wouldn't even get to see anything beyond the problem. But if you look out, it sees. So all the, all the local stars. We've mapped all the local ones. Be, tend to be in, in the Milky Way. Yeah. Oh, every single star. It's like uh, in the deep space photo, I think there's one star in that. No, one star maybe in that entire photograph. Mm -hmm. I, I forget how many objects there are in it. I think there's 10,000 galaxies in my picture. In our galaxy. In the picture. Okay. Well, our galaxy is small compared to some galaxies as well. I would describe ours as fairly average, mm -hmm. but. It may be on the smaller side of yeah. yeah. Andromeda's bigger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, when the formula was first created, obviously the numbers that were used for some of those variables were quite conservative. <laughs> now, as far as I recall, the ones that we've been discovering have actually been better than expected, yeah. apart from the very, very last one. See, the nice. problem is, you're right, those first numbers they come out far better than what the, the guys who sat at that table probably thought. Mm -hmm. So their 10,000 might not be a massive underestimate, but it's those last numbers that are absolutely, you're basically performing magic to pick a number for them at the moment, mm -hmm. because we there is no other life out there. We have not detected another world with life. The second we do that, those numbers change. All of those numbers kind of change, even if it's one in 200 billion. <laughs> Well, I was thinking, I was probably, you know, some of those other numbers that we still don't know, I 
Oh God, very likely. Because as I say, the first number has changed very much.